Hello and welcome once again to Bible Class Topics. Today we continue our study of the letter to the Hebrews. It's Lesson 8, A Superior Priesthood and a Superior Covenant. We're going to be looking at Hebrews 8, the entire chapter today. We've been talking about the three superiors in the book of Hebrews. We've talked about a superior person, Jesus Christ. We are in the midst of our study of a superior priesthood, a priesthood after the order of Melchizedek, and we'll conclude the study in a few weeks, Lord willing, with a study of the superior principle, which is faith. A superior priesthood after the order of Melchizedek includes a superior order, which we've already studied in chapter 7, a superior covenant, a superior sanctuary, a superior sacrifice, and then the Hebrew writer will take a little time out in chapter 10 to exhort his readers to not despise the word of God. Nothing can minimize the superiority of Christ's priesthood. As we will see in this lesson, he ministers based on a better covenant. And then in the next two lessons, he, we'll see that he ministers in a better sanctuary and because of a better sacrifice. In chapter 8, the Hebrew writer will present three evidences for the superior, uh, su superiority of Christ's covenant. And we'll study those. The first one being ministered by a superior high priest, then ministered in a better place, and finally founded on better promises. Before we get into our comments, I want to read the first two verses of Hebrews 8, but to get a uh, uh, running start into that, we're going to back up to Hebrews 7, 22, and then we'll just go right into chapter 8. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he, that is Christ, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath which came later than the law appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. Now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. The high priest of Christianity is superior, and that high priest is Jesus Christ himself. It should seem logical that if Christ is a superior high priest, he would be ministering a superior covenant. Here are several arguments to prove Christ is a superior high priest. First of all, as we've just read in Hebrews 7, 22 through 28, his moral adequacy is perfect. His own moral perfection makes him suitable, and I should say more than suitable, as our high priest. Also, as we read in verse 1, his finished work. There was no reason for an Old Testament high priest to sit because their work was never finished. The fact that they had to repeat their sacrifices stood as a reminder that their work was never finished. In John 1 verse 29, the next day, he saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, we're talking about John the Baptist. John the Baptist sees Jesus, 
Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Old Testament high priest could not do that. In addition to his moral adequacy and his finished work, he also is a superior high priest because of his enthronement. Where is Jesus seated? He's seated at God's right hand. In Hebrews 1.3, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. We'll, re we'll study further about this in chapter 10. I'll read verse 12. But when Christ had offered all for, for a time a single... Let me start over. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. In chapter 12 and verse 2, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. We previously studied Psalm chapter 110 in, a, in another lesson. Verse 1, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Not only did an Old Testament priest not sit, he had no throne. Only a priest and king could be enthroned. Finally, he's this, uh, our covenant is ministered by a superior high priest because of his supreme exaltation. He is ministering from the heavenly sanctuary, a place no human being other than Jesus Christ has ever been to sit and minister. That leads us to our next point, and let's read verses 3, 4, and 5. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices, thus it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and shadow of heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. In the time of this writing, it is possible that the physical temple still existed. Hebrew letter could have been written before 70 AD. It would be easy for the readers to slip back into that seeable tradition. The logical answer appears in verse 3. A high priest is required to offer gifts and sacrifices in a sanctuary. Deuteronomy 12, 13 through 14 says, Take care that you do not offer your burnt offerings at any place that you see, but at the place that the Lord will choose in one of your tribes. There you shall offer your burnt offerings, and there you shall do all that I am commanding you. Meanwhile, Christ's sanctuary, <coughs> pardon me, Christ's Christ sanctuary must be in heaven. It is unnecessary for Christ to offer himself repeatedly. His sacrifice on the cross was once for all time. In a future lesson, we'll study Hebrews chapter 9, perhaps Lord willing next week. In verse 24 through 28, For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own, for then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it has been appointed for man to die once, and after that comes the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. So the logical answer is in verse 3. The genealogical answer, however, is in verse 4. 
As king, Christ has come from the tribe of Judah. But as high priest, he was not required to be of the tribe of Levi, but after the order of Melchizedek. He's not serving as an earthly priest. He's serving as a heavenly priest. There's also a typological answer as noted in verse 5. A type is an Old Testament picture of a New Testament truth. The earthly priests were serving in an earthly sanctuary that represents a copy of the heavenly sanctuary. While the earthly temple and sanctuary would appear to be real and stable, it is actually the heavenly sanctuary that has the eternal staying power. The old law was but a shadow of good things to come. Colossians 2 and 17, Paul the Apostle said, These, speaking of the old law, are a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. In Hebrews 10 and verse 1, For since the law has but a shadow of good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Heaven is the original sanctuary, and therefore it is the better place. Where would we rather live? On the blueprint or in the building? The third point we want to make in this chapter is that this covenant is founded on better promises. Let's continue our reading um, in verse 6, and we'll just read out the rest of the chapter. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. For he finds fault with them when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbors and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful towards their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. And speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. The new covenant then is founded on better promises. In the preface to what he has to say, the Hebrew writer quotes directly from Jeremiah 31 verses uh, 31 through 34. And I'll read it again, this time not from uh, Hebrews, but straight from Jeremiah. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor, and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sins no more. So we've read this twice now. Once from the Hebrew writer as he quotes pretty much word for word from Jeremiah the prophet. The new covenant is for the Jew first and also for the Greek, as Paul often says. In his writings, Jesus stands as the go-between in the middle of man and God. Who held such a position as this under the old law? It could not be held because no one was qualified as the ultimate prophet, the ultimate priest, 
and the ultimate king. In verses 7 through 9, we want to mention the promise of God's grace. Because remember, this covenant is founded on better promises. For there to be need of a new covenant argues for the failure of the old. Man does not have within him what it would take to keep the old law. The new law depends on God's grace as opposed to purely man's obedience. In verse 10, we see the promise of internal change. In Ezekiel 36, verses 26 and 27, the prophet said, And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. And of course, this is Ezekiel the prophet quoting from God the Father. The new covenant then is inward as opposed to the outward covenant of the old law. The inward covenant, the new covenant, is also spiritual. The true believer carries the new covenant in his heart. There is the promise of forgiveness for all, verses 11 and 12. The new covenant is both individual and universal. This knowledge of God is not just for one class of believers, but for all believers. Under the new covenant, we are all priests. Gracious provisions for sin are made under the new covenant. There was no real forgiveness of sin under the old law. The old law and its sacrifices reminded one of their sin, one of their sins year after year, while the new covenant remembers our sins no more. In Hebrews 10 and verse 3, but in these sacrifices there is reminder of sin every year. That's under the old law. Verse uh, chapter 727, which we read just a few moments ago. Let's repeat that. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered himself up. On top of the promise of forgiveness for all, there is the promise then in verse 13 of eternal blessing. The new covenant did not have to wait on the destruction of Jerusalem to be inaugurated. I would send you back to verse uh, chapter 1, verse 2, chapter 7, 18 through 22, and as we've already read, chapter 8, verses 6 and 7. Jesus is the author of eternal salvation, as we learned in chapter 5, verse 9, and eternal redemption, as we'll discuss in the next lesson, chapter 9, verse 12. The new covenant is permanent, never to be replaced. Under this new covenant, we are partakers of a new nature and a wonderful new life that only comes through Christ. Jesus, as high priest in the new age, performs his service in the real heavenly sanctuary. There's no shadows or crude animal sacrifices necessary. God's presence in heaven confirms it as the real sanctuary. And, since that is where Christ performs his priestly duties in God's presence, then his service outranks all of his predecessors. If we set the two covenants side by side, it, we see that the old is clearly inferior to the new. The inability of the old to bring man close to God, coupled with Israel's continual lack of obedience, doomed it to be abolished. The new, the new Covenant provides its followers with better promises, better promises that are written on their hearts, and establishing within them a full and universal knowledge of God and removing their burden of guilt and sin forever. Thank you so much for watching. We hope that these lessons on the book of Hebrews are, have been enlightening to you and will continue to be so, helping you to get a better knowledge of the things that God would have us to do while living under his new covenant. If you would like to subscribe to this channel, I would appreciate it. 
You can also ring the notification bell and that will send you a message every time a new video is published. If you would like or even dislike this video, it would help. And also if you would leave me a comment in the comment section below, I would love to hear from you. Until we meet again to study together, may God bless.